this morning. We're looking at Isaiah 53, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, and we're looking at first, or, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. No, I don't want to upgrade, just start my timer. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good deal. But <laughs> Last week we looked at sin being the source of all suffering. Last week's message was one of those sobering reality moments of just who we are before the presence of a holy God. It's one of those messages that we need to revisit relatively often because it recalibrates our not only position with God as far as we realize and understand this, but it also uh, changes our posture when we come to God in prayer and expectation for the suffering that touches us in this life. The suffering that we experience comes because of sin's presence in the world. It is the way the world was for our parents. It will be the way that the world is for our children who come after us, should the Lord tarry in his return. And ultimately, suffering will bring the end of the journey to each of us in these bodies. It will bring death. Sin, in and of itself, leaves us in a very cold, dark place of defeat. There is not a single person outside of Christ that ever knew victory for sin. While difficult, even unpleasant of a reality, it's the truth we need to understand, we need to acknowledge. Otherwise, we'll fail to see Jesus for who he truly is. We'll fall short of embracing him for all he has done, and we'll be denying so great a salvation from a Savior, and be left to face the wrath of God against sin. It is the dark backdrop that allows the beauty of Jesus to shine as a light of incredible invitation. This unmerited favor, this grace. We need to have that reality. Why? Because if we don't, I say this, we can fail to see Jesus. And you say, how can that be, Pastor? Because the entire first century of Jewish believers, a, a covenant people, people that have generationally walked with the word of God, rejected the Messiah as a whole. Why did they reject him? Because the idea of a Messiah who would suffer was not what they wanted. They did not want a Messiah that would come to be their friend through suffering. They wanted a Messiah that would come and give them victory from suffering. I mean, we think about this. Why did they have such a problem with Jesus with all the things that he said and all the things that he did, especially the healing? Look at Lazarus, a man who was dead. Jesus raised from the dead to do what? Go back to work on Monday, pay his taxes, listen to fights, arguing, deal with illness, brokenness in a broken world. To ultimately die. Every single person Jesus healed was sent back into the world of brokenness to eventually die. Healed today to suffer another day. Most, if not all, of the people that were touched and transformed by Jesus' healing demonstration of the gospel, if they lived to the resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit of God, would have had to flee their homes, flee their jobs. And had their own family turn against them because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And I think we fail to see that sometimes. And, I, and we, we, we fail to understand that ultimately everything is about the glory of Jesus Christ. Including when he chooses to heal or chooses to give us the strength to go through. And that's what we're going to look at. But one of the things that we have to that we really understand is that God doesn't just say sin go away. It has to be removed. It goes somewhere. And when we ask for healing, when we ask for deliverance, when we want, when we want sin and the curse from, from sin gone out of this world, we have, to, we have to remember that it goes somewhere. Yes, in Christ, our sin is separated as far as the east is from the west, but it didn't just disappear. It went somewhere. And for you and I, for it to leave us, it was taken and it was put on Jesus. He endured our suffering. Why did Jesus have to suffer? So that we could have comfort and ultimately victory. Comfort through suffering, victory over sin. This act comes from God who is rich in mercy from us. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at Isaiah 53. That's where we're going to begin. This idea of a Savior who would suffer. As God's chosen servant, Isaiah prophesied that this Messiah was going to suffer every step of the way in life among us. And I, these passages, especially Isaiah 53 this week, if, if the sermons are just something that you experienced on Sunday mornings, you're, you're just barely getting a taste 
of what stands to just be your feast throughout the week. Isaiah 53 is one of those passages to read and really allow the Spirit of God to bring to life in us. There is so much. I, sometimes I, I just wish I could, I could invite everybody into what I experience when I read the Bible. It is so overwhelming, so incredible sometimes that I just have to stop, pull back. I'm either in tears or in, in an ecstatic joy and just I have to go running because so much passion is just built up from what God is saying in his word. It just needs to explode out. And, and, and in, this, in this passage of Isaiah 53, it's an invitation to step into the suffering that Jesus voluntarily stepped into himself. There was not one moment of his walk in this world that would not be touched with suffering. And it wasn't just of the flesh that he experienced on the cross. It was mental and emotional. Knowing who he was, knowing what he came to do, and experiencing the rejection that was constantly around him. Listen to this. Isaiah 53. Let's look at the first three verses. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. What Isaiah is saying is that this, this Messiah will come from an unexpected area, this dry ground where there's no expectation of life to show and, and exhibit that it's there. And it will shoot up and it will be nothing. Nothing outwardly is going to be attractive about this Messiah. He's not going to be taller than the rest of the people like Saul was. He's not going to be ruddy and handsome with beautiful eyes like David was. The suffering that would be a presence in his life would cause people to turn away because they don't want to look at it. And we, we really need to, and, and we can connect with this. And we're going to look at this a little bit more intimately with Paul. But sometimes it's like going through the news or going and, and watching those advertisements that show suffering all over the world. We tend to just fast forward or ignore it. Why? Because we don't like to look at it. Because it reminds us that the world is so much more than the, than the little bubble that we may have secluded ourselves in. But Jesus would know what it is to have people turn away from him because of the suffering that was a part of his life. Now surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Jesus' suffering would bring God's kingdom into this world. Every act of healing was a witness to the power and the authority that Jesus had. And as sin was being defeated, the fruit of it was retreating. Listen to this. In Matthew, he witnesses, Matthew, the author of the gospel, verse 14 of chapter 8. When Jesus entered Peter's house, all these scriptures are in your bulletin, or your outline. He saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. And so he, Jesus, touched her hand and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. Notice it didn't say that the fever disappeared. The fever left her. <coughs> that evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. They didn't disappear. They were cast out. They went from one place to another. Now, Matthew was understanding this under the inspiration of the Spirit, to be verse 17, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, he took our illnesses and he bore our disease. Where does sin go? Disease. Whether, and we're going to look at the seasons of suffering and why they touch our lives, but understand right here in this moment, for the fever to leave, Peter's mother was showed and demonstrated the power and the authority that Jesus had, but again, it is not just simply disappearing. The sin is going to be brought upon Jesus. He's able to heal because he's enduring it for us. What his body, what he subjected himself to, took it upon himself. And we talk about this, and this is a side note, eternal damnation, separation from God. When we read the book of Revelation, we see this great white throne judgment, and we're going to see that death and hell, sin, suffering, is all going to be picked up out of this world that's groaning and put over here to go on for an eternity. 
the sin and all the suffering because the curse goes with it. So when God removes sin from this world, he's removing all the fruit of that sin and all the curse that he put upon sin that this world groans under, and he puts it in here. So when he says that there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when he talks about eternal judgment, it's the reality of sin nonstop without God's grace interfering, without the Spirit of God interfering, without any filter. That awaits those outside of Jesus Christ as well. But for that to be removed from us and put to that place, it had to first be transferred to Jesus. And Matthew is starting to recognize that Jesus is able to heal because it was foreshadowing what he would accomplish by bringing victory over the source of suffering, which is sin. But there's more. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, in his hand. The difference between our lives and Jesus, we suffer because we're sinners. Jesus chose to suffer because he's without sin. He chose to subject himself. Jesus, like a lamb, silent. He's not dumb like an animal. He's like a lamb in that he doesn't protest because of his love for the Father, John 17. See, reading this and reading John 17 tends to bring an intimacy that no one could be there with him for. Only a son and a father could have that moment. The, the weight of this, it just, it, it's... I don't know. I, I can't expound it. It's too much for me. And it was the will of God to crush him. It was always God's plan. Jesus was always his plan A. We didn't mess things up. Our sovereign God is who is likened unto you, O Lord God. Amen. Amen. The Father loves us. Jesus loves the Father. Therefore, salvation comes to us. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He went with common thieves to experience crucifixion. Despising the shame means that he was despised, should have been despised because of the shame that is his for having to experience crucifixion. That's you and I. We deserve to be in shame because of sin and the consequence that it brings to us. We deserve this eternal endurance of God's wrath against sin. Jesus, as, as we feel shame because we're sinners and we're despised, Jesus despised how, the, how people perceived. And what the Hebrew is saying is that the shame that came upon him because people were saying he was suffering justly, he deserved to die. He was an insurrectionist. He made himself equal with God. And on and on and on with their accusations. But the reality was Jesus came to give strength, to endure through suffering, to ultimately bring victory to sin, not the Roman Empire. And the Jewish people did not want that. So he was rejected. And they found satisfaction seeing him as a bloody pulp leading that cross up to Calvary and hanging on it. It brought satisfaction. But Jesus did not allow the shame of that perception to alter his focus, which was on God the Father and his love for the Father. Because why? Making his offering for guilt in his soul, he will see his offspring. It's almost like Jesus 
being able to be up there and sing the agony, he saw the eternal presence of all of us in Christ that have been given to him from the Father in the resurrected bodies, in the glory that is Christ's alone to worship him for an eternity. It's almost like in that moment, he has a vision of what will come because of this. But it's not for the sake of that vision. It is the sake of his love for the Father in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And we have love. 11 through 12. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. And see, we have to understand, Jesus if he would have just come and died on a cross that would have satisfied sin, but it doesn't show us how to live. Jesus lived his life in order to lead up to that moment to show us what our life following in his footsteps was going to be. And nowhere does Jesus even begin to give the slightest hint that our life in him is going to be outside of suffering. Life in him is the brilliance to understand that as dark as our suffering may be, the brilliant light of Jesus' presence through it is the gospel invitation that leads people to see what was satisfied on the cross for the Father to declare it is finished, Jesus to declare it is done, and have ultimate victory over sin. As a resurrected Messiah, Jesus now makes intercession as our high priest in which we're welcomed in his throne room through the veil that was torn. Verse 12, Hebrews 53, or um, Isaiah 53, Hebrews next. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressor. Jesus is the only one in all of humanity that would have ever been able to stand be before God the Father in the presence of his judgment and say, I got in the wrong line. I shouldn't be here. But he didn't. Instead, he looks around and calls us family. Greater love. Hebrews 7, through 28. Listen to this. This makes Jesus the guarantor, uh, the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number, generationally, yet they were prevented by death from continuing in the office. Because why? They were still going to die. There's only two people who did not see death. And who were they? Who remembers? Shout it out. Enoch and Elijah. Enoch and Elijah. Kudos. Gold Star to Christian. Yeah, we were talking the other day, and uh, he, he told me he was reading through the book of Judges, and I just have to hit pause, and I just cry. Tears of joy, hearing people reading, through, not just through the scripture, but, but going through the Old Testament and pursuing to see Jesus on its pages. Now, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for the sins of his people, since he did this once and for all when he offered himself up. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word by the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Hebrews 9, 23 through 28. Listen to this. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified. He's talking about the instruments that were used in the tabernacle and then later into the temple. They were just shadows of what existed in the heavenly realm. Moses was given a glimpse of what existed in the heavenly realm when he received the instruction to pass on for the crafting of these instruments, these devices. They had to be sprinkled with the blood of animals to cleanse, to purify. Now, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy places, every year with his own blood, not his own. For then he would appear once and for all for the age and of the ages to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. 
And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. And that is going to be the removal of sin, the curse, judgment, all of that, into eternal separation from God. But what's it saying in Hebrews? It's saying that that temple, that the Jewish community and religious leaders found their strength over the beauty, the magnificence of this was nothing compared to the reality that Jesus stepped into. He didn't walk into that building made of stone crafted by human hands. A greater than the temple is him. And he went into the presence of the Father in the true holy of holies. Not crafted by human hands. What no eye has seen. And he has gone in and through his blood. Torn the reality of division. And that mere curtain. On this world. In that temple. Tore as a response. From what took place. In the greater reality. That that is only a shadow of. Jesus defeated the source. Of suffering which is sin. And he has satisfied the source of the judgment and wrath of God, which is appeasing him through the sacrifice of his own blood. We are once and for all purified in Jesus Christ. That's what he did. But he had to take on God's wrath. He had to take on our sin, and he chose to do it. So when Jesus heals, it's because he endured on our behalf. Every act of healing was a demonstration of how sin is a defeated foe. And it pulls back and retreats. But what does this mean for us? For you and I today? What's the big picture over what Jesus has done by being a suffering Messiah? That takes us to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we know this scripture. You say, Pastor, we come here so much. Look, I, my prayer is that, it, that we become so acquainted with scripture, we don't even need to open it up. We can see it, hear it, because it's that's in our hearts. Amen. And you who were dead in trespass and sins, last week's sermon, it starts with the, uh, the ugly, the dark, the cold, the unpleasant stuff. And for Marvel fans, I will share this. It's like Infinity Wars that ends on such a low note. You're like, wow, did I just sit three hours to watch this unhappy ending? <laughs> to only realize that Endgame was coming and it was going to be a victory unlike anything that they would have experienced had they not gone through that. And see, this is what's happening here is that sin is that ultimate reality of despair, destruction, and destitution that is ours, that we inherit in the moment of conception and stand to endure for the eternal separation of God that awaits sin. You who were dead in trespass and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And why did people turn away from Jesus? Why did they not want to look at his suffering? Because it reminded them of the fragileness of life and the ultimate reality that was theirs, which was going to be death. We don't like to go to hospitals because ultimately we might, are probably going to end up in one at some point in time in our life. We don't like to be around suffering because it touches us in ways that make us uncomfortable comfortable because death is not a naturalness we were not created to die it came because of sin and this death is not pleasant and every time we experience illness every time we experience something that touches us and strips us of something that we once had or feel that we should have we're reminded that eventually the grave is the destination for these bodies but god i love that but God, rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's done what? He's raised us up with him. He seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's not of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so this is the victory that you and I have. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are cleansed 
Sin is defeated and its defeat is now ours. And so it is the spirit of God who comes to indwell us. And as the fruit of sin, as sin is severed, all the roots that are part of our lives, the fruit starts to dry up as the life-giving presence of God through his spirit starts to bear the fruits of righteousness. The righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ. This transition, Galatians 5, is what the spirit is doing. Sin is defeated in our lives. And if it is prospering, it's because we are feeding it, nurturing it. But the source of sin itself, we are without excuse to stand before God in Christ and say, God, I could do nothing to stop this. No, you chose. You chose to do nothing to stop this sin in your life. You chose not to take what I'm offering you to be an overcomer over the sin in your life. Because in Christ, sin is defeated. And there is no sin that we have an excuse to be entangled with. Yes. And that doesn't come from a judgmental father. This is a father who sent his son to die for us. It's a father who loves us and wants us not to be entangled with the things that are stealing the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. Mm. But the workmanship that we are created in Christ for, we have victory in Jesus. But that workmanship, that demonstration from generation to generation of God's goodness is that victory lived out in the day-to-day -day moments of life in this world and during the season of suffering with the truth of God's word alive in us through his presence. It is that dark backdrop that allows gospel invitation to constantly shine forth. So having a proper understanding of what Jesus has done, we are seated with him in heavenly places. We can know the will of God, but submitting and enduring like Jesus did because of his love for the Father is what we're called to follow in the footsteps of. And what that's going to look like for each of us is going to be different sometimes. But ultimately, we're one in Christ. That is our reality. The big picture, we are saved in Christ. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8, verse 36, 37. As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to, to the slaughter. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah 53, the suffering Messiah was like a sheep appointed to, to suffer. And now Paul's saying that all of us who follow Jesus are like sheep that have been appointed to the slaughter. So instead of the objections... It's not fair, God. It's not right, God. How could you, God? You're failing me, God. I want health. I want wealth. I want prosperity. Instead of that sin-filled trash, we should be crying out, Father, increase my faith. Increase my faith. Father, not my will, but your will be done. I know that's easier said than done. Jesus understands that. That's why he's our faithful high priest. Come to him. Come to him. Cast your eyes on him. Commit all that you have to fall in love with him more and more every day. That's the only anchor that we can have for when suffering will touch us in all the seasons that it stands as a potential to touch us with. We have victory in Jesus. Big picture. But what does it look like lived out every moment of every day in our lives? That brings us to our closing text in 2 Corinthians. Paul writes this letter to Corinthian believers that were divided and some were resisting what God was saying through him and some were challenging his apostleship. You know why? Because of his suffering. They did not want an apostle that was making the headlines for suffering for Jesus. This is not the Christianity that they were signing up for. Now, Corinth was a, a, a cosmopolitan area where you had people from all over the known Roman world coming in. You had the best of the best. If there's anything and any sort of a mega church prosperity gospel representation in scripture, we would find it in the believers in Corinth. And for that prosperity mentality and attitude, that tolerant attitude towards sin has no place for a servant like Paul following after the footsteps of Jesus because they have no place for Jesus. And Paul's writing to them to say, hey, look, this suffering that I'm enduring is because of my love for Jesus. And it is a following in the footsteps of him. So this letter is to remind them about their suffering Messiah that they've forgotten. Because they're, as they're looking away from Paul, because, oh, yeah, I know Paul. He doesn't really represent Christianity, not my Christianity. I don't know what he's doing, but this is who I am. This is who we are. This is what we believe. 
and they're looking away from him. Now listen to this. Paul writes, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, Timothy, our brother. Timothy was also included in that, and he was pastoring here at the time, and they were listening to him. And it's, it's a hard, you're hard pressed to be a pastor preaching the truth when leadership and your congregation are against the word of God. You've got a choice. You either get up here and preach what you believe or you get up here and preach what people want to hear. And so Timothy was being faithful to preach what he believed. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now blessed be, verse 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. We're going to look at this in more detail later on. But understand this, the comfort that comes from God is because he is a merciful God. He is able to give us comforts because Jesus took upon himself the deserving wrath against our sin. And Paul's going to remind them. It's one thing to say, comfort my people. Here's some comfort for you. But understanding what took place. God, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to do what? Comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly, listen to this, in Christ's sufferings so through christ we share share abundantly in comfort too but you can't have one without the other you cannot have the comfort of god if you are not following in the steps of jesus in righteous living god's word lived out in our lives in the power and the authority of jesus through his spirit if we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, we will share abundantly in the comfort that was his. How did Jesus endure the rejection of the people in his mind? He spent tons of time in prayer, a ton of times with the Father. How was he able to be patient with his disciples who just couldn't get it figured out? How many, the frustration of saying things over and over and over, and for the 100th time, the person hears it like a child and says, oh, hey, Dad, that's a great idea. I've been, I've been begging you to see this. I, well, what happened now? And it was some other dad <laughs> that lived out something or said something that made it click with the kids, right? And see, how is Jesus able to be faithful to God and to love and to people's lives? He spent so much time with the Father in word and prayer. Let of the Spirit. For our hope, listen to this. If we are afflicted, verse 6, if we are afflicted, if I, Paul, and Timothy are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So the question is, why are you suffering, Paul? No, the question is, why are you not suffering, O follower of Jesus Christ? Where is the suffering? That is the authenticity. I'm not saying that you run out and slap somebody with a Bible and bring on the suffering or look for a fight. But this is becoming more and more a community, a world, a nation that we're going to have tremendous opportunity to experience suffering for saying, thus saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God. But we have to be determined in our heart that this is true. We have to be determined that what we understand is that we are sinners destined outside of Christ for that reality. And not look away from the faithful, faithful servants of Jesus Christ who are suffering. Not turning our faces from them. For our hope, verse 7, is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. And indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that, we will that he will deliver us again. And what Paul's saying is this situation was so overwhelming that even he as an apostle was convinced this was the end. He was convinced he was going to be meeting his Savior. His faith was going to become sight. And he committed himself to that faithfulness. That should I die right here, right now, I will be resurrected. Because our God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And if suffering costs me my life now, it is life eternal for me to live as Christ. But to die is gain, great gain. And that's what Paul was anchored on. So if this is it, hallelujah, Jesus, I'm coming home. But I will not deny you for the sake of deliverance. Amen. 
And what he's saying here, he delivered him from deadly peril. That's not what God had in mind. But Paul needed to be at that place in his heart. See, we need to be at that place with the suffering that comes into our lives that it's not us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's when we have the flu and, and, and or you have the dreaded man cold, as crippling as it can be sometimes, you realize how dependent you are on your body's antibodies, how dependent you are on medications because you get to a point where even the things that are, that are common were once life-threatening. And now we become accustomed to looking for things to relieve us of suffering. And those aren't bad in themselves health-wise, and that's not what I'm preaching. I'm not preaching don't go to hospitals, don't go to doctors, and I'm not preaching go and, and, and hurt ourselves. What I'm saying is what we experience for following Jesus, we may not have control over, but we have to be okay with the fact that our God is in control of everything. And he's working all things to a greater good. And should this be the final battle that we experience in life? Are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. The Apostle Paul believed in the power of prayer. We are in the throne room of Jesus Christ, and we are invited to pray. We are invited to intercede. Paul felt like this was going to be the end, but he welcomed the prayers of the saints. Somehow our prayers coincide with the will of the Father. And this isn't arrogance. This isn't, oh, God told me this, and you're going to be this, and you're going to be that, or this is going to be the next president. Silliness. It is the word of God lived out that should God bring deliverance, It'll be for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. not for prosperity, not for selfish gain. Paul was delivered not to live a happy life ever after. He was delivered to suffer another day because eventually he was beheaded. So all these healings and all these deliverances led him to lay his head down on a stone. Every single person that Jesus healed in scripture, raised from the dead, eventually experienced death. Our healing and our deliverances are not for our comfort and ease. It is for Jesus to be glorified Amen. through it. Amen. And in this is gospel invitation. In this. But what is the reality that we have to look forward to? What is the, what is the hope of resurrection? In 1 Corinthians 15, I don't have time, but read this this week. Read this this week. Paul said that we have bodies that are after the manner of the first Adam. From dust we have come, from, to dust we will return. But our spirit is destined for a resurrected body that will be able to abide in the presence. Because where Jesus is at, we will be, not just in a spiritual sense, but a very beyond physical reality, that it, even what this life is. We will have a body prepared for that eternal presence of hallelujah, worship, and celebration with Jesus Christ. That is what awaits us. So let's hold on to that, not lose sight of that, and keep our focus. If God heals us, what is it for? If God delivers us, what is it for? And I love this, and, I, and I'm going to read in close, Mark uh, 16, verse 14. Now, after he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they were reclining at a table, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And they will go the natural course of that judgment of the sin. They will stand before a holy God that will not be able to extend mercy and grace because they neglected so great a salvation in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And they will justly stand and receive the judgment, the wrath of God against sin. And with sin and its curse will be cast into that eternal separation. See, that's the reality that we are preaching. This is why. This is good news. This is why this is good news. This is why a suffering Messiah was such good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick. They will, be, they will recover. 
And so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, and he has sat down at the right hand of the Father, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. We have victory today and forever in Jesus Christ. In this life, we will suffer, but we can be confident that he is with us, working through us all things for his glory. And listen to this. This life lived for his glory is but a short breath compared to an eternity of being in and celebrating his glory. Let me read that one more time. This life lived for his glory is but a short breath compared to the eternity of being in his glory and celebrating his glory. So let us not lose heart. Let us keep the faith, always remembering we're not alone. It doesn't matter if people turn away from us amidst our suffering. We have a Savior who understands. We have a high priest who understands and is with us. But my prayer is that we as a community of faith, we're not turning our faces away from suffering. And we're not believing false prosperity, gospel, nonsense, and silliness. We come to the word of God, the feast on truth. And if God heals, and I say that there are times God heals through praying over somebody, through me, but doesn't heal me. Then heal my wife. There, I, I don't control God. I just faithfully pray, believing that he can heal anything and everything that I come before him and ask. And I always have that confidence. I will never come into the throne room of Jesus Christ and start with the third level of, of confidence. I am over the top, right up front. Jesus, just, just flick your finger. And it's gone. It's done. Praying in that confidence but accepting what he does, what he says, and what he gives. Why? Because if it helps people see more beautifully through my life and through my suffering, Jesus, I'm trusting that he'll give the grace that is sufficient to continue to the next day and the next day and on the glory of Jesus. God is working through our suffering for his glory. Trust and rest in his grace.